David King, I mean, just retired from government as the envoy for climate change. So, uh, so you were chief, you were chief scientific advisor. I was chief scientific advisor government. with Blair and Brown, and then I went into the Foreign Office, and I've been working on climate change. And but more importantly, you're you're you were Cambridge chemistry. Much more important. <laughs> I, I was head of chemistry here. In Cambridge. Uh, so I, I think, I think the, the starting point is um, a defense of the UNFCCC agreement reached in Paris, which, as you pointed out, doesn't manage to mention geoengineering or its importance. Uh, and I was one of those backing the position taken at the UNFCCC, so I'm the one you should shoot down. But I, I'm, I'm going to say critically important that we focus on reducing CO2 levels in the atmosphere. Because it's game over if we don't manage to do that. And I think you were slightly pessimistic in your comments about that. But let me say only slightly, and I mean that word carefully. Uh, the, the level of CO2 in the atmosphere, as you may know, stabilized after the last point on your graph. 2013. Ever since then, CO2 levels have not risen. So it's it's quite important because that graph just your latest data point there is 2013. So yes, you're right. So interestingly enough, the last three years have not seen any increase. It hasn't seen a decrease, but it does look as if we've plateaued at least. And that has been driven by the fact that the renewable energy uh, arena has transformed things far more quickly than most people expected. In 2014, more than half of the world's new electricity power installation was from renewable energy. And the reason is because it's become competitive with fossil fuel energy, all driven by European Union feed-in tariffs. And so we are winning the battle when we get to the commercial point where renewable energy is cheaper. And so I, I wouldn't say that it's too pessimistic to expect the curve that you are showing there. However, and this is a very important point, that curve, in my view, does not get you to 2 degrees centigrade with a 50% probability chance. I'm going to say to, to get to 50 degrees, oh, sorry, 50, to get to 2 degrees with a 50% chance, you need to hit net zero emissions by about 2055. So it's a much sharper fall than shown there. And Is that with or without uh, um, no geoengineering? No geoengineering. No so no carbon capture and storage. In my view, no carbon capture and storage. I completely agree with your comment about CCS. It's not going to happen anything like scale. But we need to aim for 1.5 degrees centigrade. We lose the Arctic sea ice before we get to 2 degrees centigrade. We need to aim for 1.5. Which means we need to aim for net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2035. So you're wanting this curve to come down in there. That's roughly what I'm saying. And how does that ever happen? It only ever happens if it can be commercially driven. So uh, well, one of the issues here is now, that... I'm, I'm, I'm just to finish. Okay. I'm not going to say... Well, I wasn't that going to... I wasn't that going to geoengineering work going on. I'm a great supporter of that. It's got to be in the back pocket and it's got to be in the back pocket so it can be pulled out very quickly. But I... I don't want to take any focus away from the global effort to shift away from fossil fuel burning. And I think that's right. I don't want to take the, I'm not going to take the microphone away because I've got a question for you. Um, uh, but uh, so the uh, conversion, not burning fossil fuels to make electricity. Electricity accounts for perhaps 20% of global it's fossil fuels. So heat and electricity. So we have to think. I mean, I'm getting a new boiler at home, and I wanted to get an electric one. Of course, I'm nuts to do that, because they're much more expensive, and they're not um, it's, it's still going to be burning fossil fuels effectively. In France, perhaps, it's OK, because there's more nuclear. But then electric cars, electric shipping, electric 
um, container ships, electric planes, electric industry, not burning fossil fuels. So the remaining 80% of fossil fuels also has to be uh, dealt with. And that we need to get to net zero greenhouse gas emissions. We're not going to get to that point unless we have new carbon dioxide sinks. And so a big part of the British government position is that we need a massive reforestation program. And our position is uh, an area the size of India has to be reforested by 2020, no, sorry, 2030. And we have 52 forested nations signed up to this program. And there is something like $6 billion at the moment standing in that uh, box, mm. just funded by Britain, Germany, and Norway. Right, so uh, if we get to that point, that is equivalent to all of the emissions from the United States today in a, in a new uh, uh, sink created by uh, reforestation. That also means, and I, uh, you're giving me time, so let me what is, what is that? it also means that we have to trap more carbon in the soil. Now, the British government has been running a series of very detailed experiments in Ethiopia and East Africa. And we're finding that by putting, these have been very expensive experiments, it's part of the aid program, by putting carbon back into the soil, instead of putting fertilizer into the soil, putting carbon into the soil in the form of compost and replowing over four to five years, and then stop replowing and just drill to put the seeds in the land, you don't get methane emissions from the plowing, and the productivity of those areas, as an average, has gone up a factor of five in, in food productivity. Now, what you're then doing is putting carbon in the soil. If we can do that, if in every farmland in the world, we increase farmland productivity, but we're also putting something like one-seventh of today's emissions of carbon dioxide back into the soil. Now, we need all of these things. So this is a David Mackay thing, that we need, a, we need a solution that adds up. So we need all of these things. And that will be... I'm going to say it's a David King thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> um, so, I, I, in, in, sort of in defense of my talk, I've been to so many talks where the word geoengineering is simply not <coughs> mentioned. And, and so this is a reaction, if you want, if you yes, like to do that. Okay. But you are absolutely right. We must, at all <coughs> costs, stop. We've got to get rid of our fossil emissions. Can I? You can introduce yourself, too. Oh, sorry, I'm Barney Worthington, and I'm um, neither a chemist nor an engineer, but interested in this. But a member of the house. But a member, member of the house. Member of the house, <laughs> and, and author of the... Well, one of the authors of the Climate Change Act. Yes, but I, I, I had some practical questions about I'll the, uh, uh, no, I'll just oh, sorry um, about the the solar tower in particular. So, Hugh, you know, I'm quite curious about this, but um, I, because I'm not a chemist, can you sort of humour me and tell me about the catalyst? Does it need to be recharged at all, or is it something that you fit once? Does and then... it need to be kept clean? Yeah. yeah. Yes, 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 and yes. So. Um, we're having a, a meeting in a couple of weeks' time to talk through all of these things. Uh, the, the project that um, we hope sometime soon to get funded has uh, a part of the project is to look at the what they call the pollution of the catalyst, so that um, if it has to be replaced, recharged, cleaned every two weeks, then it's not going to work. But the thought is that it ought to be possible that Pilkington, Pilkington Glass is one of the um, partners of our project and they have this smart glass, coated glass to deal with pollution in cities. Um, and the idea is that, well, five years is kind of a, a, a figure, but whether we have to replace the catalyst every five years or to clean it every five years, well, that's, we, don't, we don't know. Now, the, the catalyst... The most, uh, the, the most abundant, the simplest catalyst you to use is titanium dioxide. And the researchers at uh, UCL uh, in London are doing work on, uh, I think it's um, 
200 nanometer coatings, I probably get that wrong, of titanium dioxide on glass <coughs> blowing gas over the surface of it and seeing how it works with UV light. Um, what we've got to look at closely is whether that uh, photocatalytic reaction turns our night N2O into NO2, which we don't want, or perhaps it produces free radicals which make their way up into the stratosphere, which then screw up the ozone layer, or perhaps, or perhaps, or perhaps. So um, this is what research is all about. Um, and, um, well, we don't know. That's why we need to do the project. But the, the, the neat thing about this, um, uh, the idea of this tower, is that it's, um, we know from a kind of a, a mechanical engineering point of view that they work. And there's a, there's a wonderful book, which I don't have with me here, but it's written by a company called Schleichbergermann around 1992, which um, puts into the public domain all the sums required to build these things. I mean, it's, it's, it's written by the company uh, from a point of view of generating electricity from solar towers. So it's a, it's a relatively small uh, step in terms of, and now we're talking about big towers, you know, again, 800 metres high. It's a rel relatively small step to repurpose these towers for this trying to get a cubic kilometre per second. So the, the hard bits are the, the things like the photocatalysis, the, the, the chemistry, and you can kind of think that if you can get the chemistry to work properly on a few square meters in the lab, with lots of dirty gas going through it, you can learn a lot on a small scale, because each one of these, they're all going to be rather similar to each other. So the, the research to figure out ca catalyst pollution ought not to be too difficult. So we should do it. Thank you. If I had a Second question, it was really just about the location of them. If the methane's bubbling up in the, in the Arctic and the, these are all in the equator, it, it's, does in the that, in the, does, does that, does it, how long is it, it I mean, I, I guess it just all makes it in its So would you like to hand the microphone yeah. to Paul? She can answer that okay. question. I, I'm Paul from Ingham, I work at the University of East Anglia. Yeah, to put it back so, I work at the University of East Anglia on greenhouse gases. Um, so methane is an atmospheric lifetime of about 12 years. So even if it does come up in the Arctic water sources, it tends to get heavy warming. So the atmospheric uh, circulation time scale is only over the point of two years. And so then the N2O has a very long lifetime, so it doesn't really matter where it comes up. So atmospheric circulation, am I right in thinking, is of the order of six months to a year? Yes, but the, in, the, the, the transport from the northern to southern hemisphere tends to be on a much longer time scale, okay. so that it's close, closer to a year. Right. So, no, so the mixing is, um, is yeah. sufficient. Um, so what, what would happen? Will, will nitrous oxide and methane come bubbling out of the oceans and just completely uh, nullify the effect of what um, we might be trying to well do? Well, I think it depends a little. So there's a, this dynamic equilibrium between the atmosphere and the ocean, which is basically dependent on the relative partial pressures in each reservoir. So if you draw down the atmospheric concentration of either of the other gases sufficiently, there is a reservoir of N2O and methane in the ocean which could potentially come back into the atmosphere if the gradient reverses. Other questions? We've got one over here. David Newland was head of the department and more importantly was my PhD supervisor. <laughs> I'd like to ask you, David, uh, is there any conflict between reforestation and agriculture? Is there going to be a row between the farming community and those who want to turn agricultural land into trees? Because it seems that this is the ideal solution, if there is enough land available then to do it. That's exactly why I coupled my comment about reforestation with the comment about increased agricultural productivity per hectare, which also couples with uh, putting carbon back into the soil. So I, I think as long as we do both and we have to do it right across the world, 
it's manageable. While I've got the mic, I've got another. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to stop This will be my last one. Of all of the geoengineering that I've been looking at, I come back to Salter's uh, putting seawater up into, into the, atmosphere, the upper atmosphere. And the attraction there is we want, as a priority, as you've said, to refreeze the Arctic. The, the, the worst thing that can happen is losing Greenland ice and the fear is that once the Arctic uh, ice is gone, the sea ice is gone, Greenland ice will go more, much more rapidly. If we put up cloud cover, some of these people are assuring me that we can use winds to see that the cloud cover goes into the Arctic region so that we're reflecting summer sun away from the Arctic region and preventing the, the melting. So that, is that a feasible way? You, you just listed it as one of the techniques, and I know you want to talk about this one, but what is your view? Well, I don't think it'll work. So, and I'll tell you why. So I've, I've, I've had meetings with Stephen Salter at all sorts of, all sorts of times. Um, the, um, the scale, I think, the amount of salt water you need to spray is, is pretty high. So this is the Salter Marine Cloud Brightening device. Now, um, it's, the idea is you suck seawater up from underneath. It's meant to be all wind powered, um, which is fine. The, um, quantity of seawater that's needed to achieve a certain amount of brightening is not yet established. So I think before we really say, yes, it's a great idea, the experiment which needs to be done is an experiment which is, has not yet been done. It's been proposed but still never actually been done. Is to say, right, let's get a 100 kilometre long strip of of sea, 10 kilometers wide, and we sail up and down with a device like this, up and down, and measure it. And then measure the quantity of seawater that is required to achieve the required change in uh, cloud albedo. So I was at a conference last November where we tried to do back of the envelope calculations of how much seawater would be required, and it just seems to be astronomically too much because the amount of seawater you have to pump to get a certain amount of cloud whitening is it's just in the wrong ballpark. But we don't, we just don't know. That's the first, my first gut feel concern is that it will be, it, it, that it might just be the wrong order of magnitude. The next one is, these are fine in, in good weather. Now to design one of these things to withstand bad weather, storms, uh, this is where the salted duck came, came into had problems. So the salted duck was looking at extracting wave energy. Um, now it's fine, you want wave energy. Well, in a big storm, and the huge, great big waves come in, you have to design your device to be resistant to that. Um, Polaris, the wave energy device, again, that is, it works fine when the waves aren't too big, but once the waves are too big, it, it, it has to be towed into calm water. So, now these are the practical issues. And uh, it's just a guess that, that until we get those sorted out, we ought not to be too confident that they'll, they'll work. So the idea of marine cloud, cloud brightening, I think, is, is, is fantastic and ought not to be dropped. But um, when the SPICE project was being funded, one of the projects, projects that was on the cards was to do experiments on marine, marine cloud brightening. But at the time, the, the, the back of the envelope calculation of whether it would, uh, it could work, hadn't been done. I feel as if we can get that back of envelope calculation nailed. It's almost as if this technology has been developed, but we still haven't got the back of envelope calculation as to whether the scale is right. That's my feeling. Salter, um, Salter has done. Well, so he, he, 
it hasn't yet been established in the community as, oh yes, this is the calculation, oh yes, I agree with that, and yes. Unlike the stratospheric aerosols, where within, within an order of magnitude, everyone is content yep. that 10 million tonnes a year is the number. It might be 20, it might be 5. Um, so that's, that's why, it's, that's where, my, <coughs> where I have my reservation. Uh, Chris Burgoyne from Cambridge. Um, the, the, the two issues that I've heard and, and sound sensible to me about the marine cloud brightening is that it works well if the clouds are on the point of forming anyway. If the cloud, if it's already cloudy, then there's no point in doing it. Um, if the clouds, if it's a long, if the atmosphere is a long way from forming clouds, then effectively what will happen is that they will evaporate very quickly. So the clouds have got to be on the point of, of, of forming. And the other point is, as we found within the SPICE project, that anything you've put up into the atmosphere really has to get above the tropopause, otherwise it comes down very quickly. So the, if, you, if marine cloud brightening can be made to work and you've got the right weather conditions, you've got to keep doing it almost continuously in order to achieve anything. Uh, whereas, um, uh, uh, which, anything below the tropopause has got lifetimes of the order of days or weeks before it comes down. Anything above the tropopause, which is where we were with the SPICE project, has probably got a residence time of two or three years. It, uh, gravity eventually will win, uh, but uh, you do have to be above that threshold. So, so there's questions up here. Right. So, if you uh, put the aerosol, it's a question about the aerosol, what's the lifetime of that? So do you have to be doing it continuously because you're back at the envelope calculations, you seem to be saying like per day, per hour, you know? Um, or can you do it um, kind of once and how much of an effect would that have? So broadly speaking, the, um, the time it takes for the aerosol to uh, come down from the stratosphere, if you put it up at 20 kilometers, in middle latitude, sort of 30 degrees north or south. It takes maybe six months, nine months to gradually make its way up towards the North Pole or South Pole, depending on which hemisphere you're in. So the residence time is at the order of six months-ish, nine months, is that the right sort of figure, Park, would in you say? In the stratosphere. It can be longer. Maybe a bit longer? Yeah, a few years. Um, but, it, but it does mean that the um, uh, you are talking about maintaining a continuous um, a concentration. So the uh, Mount Pinatubo concentrations uh, went from uh, that maximum immediately after, very shortly after the eruption, and it was, took about six months, nine months to about a year. About a year to come down. So Mount Pinatubo is kind of the the reference. What happens when it comes down? Is there, it are there comes down. Effects? So it's um. So 10 million tons a year might sound a lot, um, but it's, um, if you think of it, I think it works out to be about a teaspoon on a football pitch. If you imagine you're sprinkling stuff on your football pitch, um, it's, it, that feels a lot. Hmm? A teaspoon every... Yeah, it's, it's every, every yeah, but it's constant, you're right. So. I, I'm, I'm not advocating it. I'm advocating to stop burning fossil fuels. Let me. <laughs> how many times do I have to? No, it's, it's correct. But um, you know, if we do have these technologies in our back pocket, as you as you put them, that it's um, it's as well to it's as well to have got the science right and to look at what the what the possible side effects are. Stuart Grassy. Stuart Grassy, I was a PhD student here and I now work on railways. Um, uh, it does occur to me, and I'm not suggesting this is something that actually already works, but there's stacks of things going up, uh, not quite 20 kilometres, but uh, half that uh, every day. Um, and uh, so instead of regarding our flying to Sydney as being bad news, if we could find some way of making planes run on fuel cells, let's say, we'd have a way of putting water up in the atmosphere uh, from planes going up there every day and carting people around. There is a lot to be said for this. 
um, that we, if you look at the, the, the contrails to a plane, um, that there, um, there is something to be said for using reflectivity uh, from contrails uh, to our advantage. Um, and there is a, a bit of a conspiracy going around that the oil companies have been doing this for years. They've been putting stuff into aviation fuel so that these contrails have been whiter and more pronounced than they used to be, so that helps help to keep the climate a bit cooler, so that the oil companies can keep on burning the fossil fuels. Now, this chemtrails conspiracy theory, um, well, it's kind of, I think it's maybe a couple of decades ahead of its time, because it's something that we might actually possibly be able to do now, but 10, 15 years ago when this started up, it, it, it did seem a bit nuts. But if you think about it, um, putting stuff in at that altitude, 10 kilometers, it comes out more quickly. It's, it's closer to the, it's in this tropopause, which we're in the mixing zone between the stratosphere and the troposphere. So anything you put there doesn't stay up as long, so you have to put more of it up. Um, well, you're going up there anyway. Yes, but we could do it. But it's, it's, we're talking 10 million tonnes a year up at 20 kilometres. We'd perhaps be talking 100 million tonnes at 10 kilometres. I just don't know the figures. Um, but yes, I mean, we could do that. But there is another thing that's worth thinking about. And I think that I, these um, contrails that we see when we look up, if from above you look down, you can see the... the the, the trails from behind ships because their, their exhaust gas goes up, it causes precipitation of water. So I think that's where the marine cloud brightening came from. It, well, if, if ships can do it, then so can we can, we can do it ourselves. Um, these contrasts form in ideal conditions. And you know, when the conditions are just right, and when they're just right, you get lots of contrails. Um, I think the same is true with ship tracks, that they form in ideal conditions. But yeah, look, if, if it can be made to work, it ought to be made to work. There's another room, geoengineering SRM uh, uh, proposal, which is called Cirrus Cloud Thinning. I think that's right, is that the one? Because if you go up very, very high, it turns out that the cirrus clouds are a bit too thick and they act as a greenhouse barrier. And so we could thin the cirrus clouds and thinning them <coughs> means seeding them with just the right size particle to cause the cirrus clouds to rain out. So there's lots of things we ought to be, we ought to be thinking about. Um, I'm, I'm keen to talk about this endlessly, but I'm no one ought to feel embarrassed about leaving because it's it's getting on. But I'm we're going to I'm going to be talk, I want to talk to people about this for much longer. So why don't we take we'll carry on the questions exactly as we are. But why don't we just take a natural pause? <laughs>